Cool. Okay, so um, I work in financial services. I'm the evil banker in the room. Uh, <clears throat> so I work for Lloyd's Banking Group, and my office is notionally just at the end of the road. So I'm at, uh, along in Earl Grey Street, so it wasn't a hefty commute to get here. Uh, I work in the DevOps COE, so that's the DevOps Center of Excellence. That is a fairly gruesome um, headshot. So my title is DevOps COE um, Lead for Z. Uh, and that's not the Russians, that means Z for zero downtime, which is the mainframe. So I was a software engineer by trade. So I've been at this for a long time. Uh, my first commercial delivery was in 1986, and it was a game, and you can, you can play it online because somebody's nicely converted that to a Java emulator. Um, I've been with Lloyd's for about 20 years in its various guises, so I started off as Bank of Scotland and then became HBOS and then became Lloyd's Banking Group. Um, I've worked in lots of technical teams doing lots of things, so I joined the bank originally to do Java, uh, when Java was uh, moving to one, version 1 1.2. <coughs> I couldn't also answer the mainframe questions, um, so I got stuck in the mainframe team. Uh, so, my role at Lloyd's is to be an active advocate for uh, modern software development on the mainframe. Uh, and that's what we're going to have a little chat about uh, this evening. So, let's move it on. So, who's Lloyd's? This is the corporate background. Okay, so Lloyd's uh, were formed in 2009. Uh, shotgun wedding between Lloyd's TSB and HBOS. Uh, we are the UK's largest bank. We've got 26 million customers. We've got 18 million active digital customers. Uh, we process payments worth several, several times the UK's GDP. Uh, as an organisation, they have a history of uh, paying back to the community. So we're, we're really active uh, within the community. Uh, we have charitable foundations. We sponsored Children in Need a couple of years ago. We've been sponsoring MenCap for the last couple of years. Okay, quick survey. So when I said mainframe, uh, when I got up here, um, quick show of hands, is this what somebody thinks the mainframe looks like? Uh, so some, uh, some of you are sitting on the fence, which is good, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I did show this picture uh, to a whole bunch of Lloyd software engineers uh, several years ago um, in London and said, is this what you think the mainframe team work on? And almost everybody in the room who wasn't a mainframe programmer put their hand up. <laughs> How about if I showed you that? Would you think that's what a mainframe looks like? Yeah, you, you'd be correct. Um, so that's, that's IBM's newest baby. That's a Z16. Um, it is everything you need, and it's about the size of a filing cabinet. So it no longer requires a, a dedicated room, it doesn't need air conditioning, uh, it doesn't need guys in white coats to fettle it. Um, it is just another server now uh, in your computer hall. Okay, how about these things? If I showed you that, do you think that's a mainframe? Okay, how about that? Is that a mainframe? Possibly, you've come closer, you'll see that's COBOL, that's a mainframe as well. So you don't have to use the green screen. Whoops, I've got a bit carried away with myself there. How about that guy up there? That looks fairly like a, a standard Linux terminal. Yep, mainframe, not mainframe. Yep, that's a mainframe as well. How about that one? That is, uh, for those of you who can't see it from the back of the room, uh, that's some Java, that's a Maven project in Visual Studio Code. Mainframe, not mainframe? Yeah, you're getting the trend here, I'm the mainframe guy. So yeah, so that's, that's mainframe as well. And it's a Maven project. Uh, okay, how about that one? So that is an OpenShift container platform console. Yeah, that is the mainframe as well. So basically the... If you thought the mainframe looked like the, the 1960s picture, it's like expecting Stevenson's rocket to turn up when you go to the station. Uh, the mainframe might have been born in 1964, but it has stayed ahead of the trend ever since. So this is an open source meetup. So if we have a chat about uh, open source on the mainframe. 
So this is a, this is a real world example. Um, this is uh, well, let's call this a traditional open source consumption. Okay. Uh, so Visa and Mastercard. Um, obviously, we produce cards, credit and debit cards for both card schemes. Both card schemes like to do the same thing in a slightly different way. So Visa will call something a CVV and Mastercard will call it a CVC. Uh, they both want to do RESTful services. They both want to do RESTful services that use um, JSON Web Encryption. We want to consume their RESTful services. And what they've been kind enough to do is publish a lot of this as open source. Okay, so if you go into GitHub, you can find there are repos from Visa and MasterCard. Um, we did a couple of projects with them. So for Visa, we did um, a thing called Click to Pay, which is like the Visa equivalent of PayPal. Whole bunch of uh, APIs we had to integrate. Visa gave us an API consumption guide and they pointed us at a GitHub repo. And they suggested we use um, uh, a Nimbus library to do the uh, JSON web encryption uh, with a backup of Bouncy Castle uh, if our uh, crypto library wasn't configured correctly on the mainframe and I said it'll, it'll help you out in test. Right? So a mainframe program with things called Bouncy Castle and Nimbus in it, right? You would never, never have imagined that five minutes ago. Um, MasterCard, same thing. They have a whole bunch of RESTful APIs that we want to consume. They did everything themselves, so they didn't reference other um, libraries. They did the entire thing themselves, and they published their entire implementation on GitHub and Maven Central, and you can just consume it. So it's a way for us of going faster, so we can consume things that are, for the bank, are produced by trusted sources, but you'd say Nimbus and um, Bouncy Castle don't sound like they come from particularly trusty sources. So we've got this guy, we've got ALF. And ALF is our safe way of ingesting uh, open source. So ALF is the gatekeeper. Uh, the reason it's called ALF is the project that created and picked the first name of the bank's list of projects, <coughs> and it was an A, so it was ALF. What ALF is, is a proxy for all the uh, open source libraries our developers would want to consume things from. So it sits in front of Maven Central, Ruby, yada, yada, yada. So you can write um, your Maven project and you can code your poem to pull in your dependencies. Okay. And Al stands between your platform, in this case the mainframe, and outside world. And as we consume things from the open source community, uh, Alf will do things like check the license is within the bank's appetite. It will scan the contents of the thing that we're pulling in and check it against the kind of top 10 must fix vulnerabilities. And it will give the engineers who are building stuff, consuming open source components, a guide. So green, green good to go, uh, no vulnerabilities discovered, licenses within the bank's appetite, fill your boots, that's good to go to production. You could get an amber, which is Potentially, the license isn't within our appetite, so it might be sort of a freemium ware, so we've got, there is a license for commercial use. Uh, and if your project wants to stump up the license, you, you will then be allowed to consume that component. Uh, or red, we've discovered one of the must-fix vulnerabilities, and you're not even allowed to take it into development. So that was put in place originally for the guys who were working on the x86 stack and who were... Uh, writing the, the, the bank's first uh, programs that were officially consuming open source. That capability that was put in place for x86 is now available for guys who are going to write uh, Java, in this case, uh, for the mainframe. So within our cards application, which is what I used to work on before I started doing DevOps, we've got Java modules in there, which pr uh, provide the Visa and MasterCard functionality, and they are underpinned with things that have been consumed from the open source community. So, what's next? Okay, what I'm going to talk about now comes with a health warning, right? So this is, this is kind of Danger Will Robinson territory. We, as an organization, like to experiment, okay? That, we're a bank and we like to experiment. We do actually like to experiment. <laughs> we like to try things out. So we are now looking at 
what else can we do with the mainframe platform? Because the mainframe platform is not going away. Uh, the mainframe platform within Lloyd's is branded as strategic, which means we can start to attract new workloads onto that platform. It doesn't mean we're going to write new COBOL programs. Can I ask you a question? Yep. What's the difference between a mainframe computer and a normal computer? Um, capacity, to be honest. So the, the, there are lots of things you will get in a Z series machine uh, that you have to bolt on to a commodity PC. Um, so the, out, out of the box, you get high availability, you get a lot of resilience. So Google Cloud, say 99.9% .9 availability, that single LPAR, that single box that we showed, that's, if, you just, if you wheeled that into your data center and set it up, IBM will guarantee you 99.9% .9 availability for just that one box. Uh, you set up a couple of boxes uh, and a little bit of connectivity, you'll suddenly go to five nines, if you have metro um, kind of distance data centers and a little bit more kit, you can get to six nines availability. Uh, and that's 32 seconds of down, unscheduled downtime. Uh, but that all comes uh, in the box. And I have a slide on that a little bit further on. So one of the experiments we started this year was to look at, now we've got a new strategic platform, um, what can we do to attract new workloads? So like I said, it's unlikely we're going to start writing more new COBOL programs because colleges and universities are not turning out more COBOL engineers, right? They're turning out guys who can write Java, who, who like to work in Node, who like to do Go. <laughs> Python. <laughs> yeah, you can run all those languages on the mainframe. Um, you can also... Uh, make the mainframe look like the cloud. So if you look at the, some of the hype on LinkedIn, it was the original cloud. Uh, and we're going to make the mainframe look like any other cloud platform, but give people the benefits of the Zeddy goodness, as I like to call it, and we, we will get to that. So there, there needs to be an impetus for this. And it, large organizations don't kind of, they're, they're like, they are like tankers, uh, and they need to be prodded every now and again. Uh, and so over the last few years, a lot of modernization has been the rush to the cloud, okay? And take things that are running on-prem, on mainframes, on-prem x86, and look at how we can shift them into the cloud. And then Dora comes along, okay? So Dora uh, gave the, the banks within Europe a bit of a prod to remind them. So it's not so much Dora the Explorer, it's DORA, the Digital Operations Resilience Act. Um, what that basically says to financial uh, organizations, and this is on the back that everybody's rushing to the cloud, everybody's rushing to the same four cloud providers. So remember what you're taking off uh, and popping it in the cloud. What happens if the cloud fails? Because the regulators were starting to get worried that if the cloud failed or a cloud provider failed, it wasn't just... Lloyd's or NatWest, who were going to have an outage, it was a big chunk of the, 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 the banking system. Uh, and so the banks were, hey, we're going to the cloud. And banks have got a habit of um, hiding behind contracts. So Google said we would get 99.9% .9 availability. Um, so Dora says you can't hide behind a contract. You've got to actively prove that what you say is going to happen is the thing that's going to happen. Um, also, they invented the, uh, the, the important business service. So we like talking about acronyms, so this is IBS. So an important business service would be the thing that gets you on Twitter uh, if it fails. So debit cards, for example, if something happened to the debit card service, or if something happened to the core banking service and you couldn't do faster payments, those would be an important business service. And the regulators were saying that, okay, we're not gonna stop you putting things in the cloud, but just be aware that if you put something in the cloud and it fails, we will come along and slap you effectively because you should be taking better care of that service. So DORA is a piece of um, European legislation, uh, but CBEST and Sequest are their UK equivalents. Uh, so CBEST uh, is the, we have to actively test that something is what it says it is. Uh, and Sequest is the attestation from the, the um, financial institution 
that they have done all the due diligence. And by the way, if it fails, it also tells them what the penalties are gonna be. So because of Dora and her friends, uh, the mainframe has become strategic again because it is a way of doing a lot of this on-prem stuff with the protection, chatting about high availability and resilience uh, that you need. So from an experimental perspective, how could we mobilize? This is another benefit of the mainframe. So there's our Z16 again. In a Z16, you would have 200 processing units. So those are Telum processors and they are 10 core. So that's a lot of kit. Okay, so um, IBM are really nice. And when they fuel one of these things into your data center, they tend to be fully populated. So from a manufacturing perspective, it's easier just to give you all the racks. So you pay for the amount of capacity you think you're gonna use. But if you suddenly decide you need some more capacity, then our nice friends at IBM will give you a code to switch them more on. So everything we needed to do to set up an internal OpenShift private cloud running on the mainframe already existed in the data center. So we pulled together a little skunkworks team. So there were some engineers from Lloyd's. And so I'll tell you my background is software engineering. I have learned more about mainframe, ha mainframe hardware in the last couple of months than I would probably never wanted to know. Um, some guys from Red Hat and some really good, cool guys from IBM. So we had um, help from a guy in Colorado who would get up at crazy o'clock to have calls with, with, with us in the UK. And in this, from probably February, March, we've stood up a complete OpenShift cluster running on two plexes, so four IBM mainframes. So it's high availability, high performance. Uh, and we're now opening it up to our dev teams to play with. So capacity. Just to give you an idea, these are the two boxes. This is lifted from the physical design for our um, implementation. We've got we had two plexes. We had 72 spare engines in one plex. So things that we weren't already playing for. So these are, these are processing units that are in the cabinet doing nothing. Another plex that we picked, um, we had 111 spare processing units. Now, to stand up a complete OpenShift installation, so that is three partitions, so three logical uh, partitions with multiple virtual machines. So you've got a bastion on each of these three logical partitions and you've got a uh, control plane and you've got some workers. Um, it's 10 of these uh, processing units, okay? And that gives you a lot of capacity to actually run workload as well. So you think about it, we could have independently, so like seven running on that machine and 10, 11 running on that machine. And that's just enabling capacity we've got in the data center. So this is a tiny, tiny, tiny writing. So I promise I'll tell you what it is. I'll put my glasses on so I can read my own notes. Putting aside um, the benefits of containerization and open source, this is what you get for running this on the mainframe. So developer ecosystem, it's a cloud native developer ecosystem. From the screenshots I layer on, you can, if you really want to do it, you can do it with a green screen. You can do it with Eclipse. You can work on it with Visual Studio Code. It's pretty much bring your own IDE. So whatever you would want to, to use, it's the same, okay? So the, we, we want to make this as agnostic for the developer as possible. The developer doesn't have to know his ultimate target is a mainframe. It's just a cloud thing somewhere because at the end of the day, it's some code, it's a Tekton pipeline that does some build, it's a deployment, and your Kubernetes cluster is up and running. It could be anywhere. First big benefit you get, co-location and data gravity. Wonderful phrase. Um, the enhancements IBM have made to their operating system to bring uh, OpenShift and a thing they call Containers for Z extension. It's damn clever because it recognizes that if your code is calling out to a service that actually lives on the mainframe, it never leaves the box, okay? So if you're calling a RESTful service, you've got a banking front end for mobile banking that is running in a container on OpenShift on one of my spare uh, processing units and the DB2 database for that 
uh, back end is running on the same mainframe, then that RESTful service call to the developer is the RESTful service call, but the operating system recognizes that it's on a mainframe and your hundreds of milliseconds you'd expect for a fast response turn into microseconds because the whole thing runs it in memory speeds. And that, that's a huge, huge benefit. Can you, it's possible to say more about how does that work? IBM man. So there's a so there's a <laughs> there's a tech. Okay, so the IBM I've got IBM I've got a technology called HyperSockets. Okay, so basically within their 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 kind of implementation of Z Linux. So they've got it's Red Hat 8.4 we're running. Okay, but in the 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 Linux guest, the Linux virtual machine that that runs in. Okay, their I/O kernel, which is obviously IBM proprietary recognizes the fact, so mainframe has its own network within the box, right? Recognizes that the ultimate endpoint for that call is also on a mainframe network. Uh, and if it's in the same box, in fact, it could even be in the same tray for ultimate performance. Remember, each uh, in your, your cabinet, each tray has got 10 CPUs in it. So some of those CPUs could be running, <laughs> could be running your Z Linux, others could be running DB2. Uh, and the networking recognizes that they're next door to each other. Uh, and so it, your networking is more secure because it never leaves the box. So there's no uh, load balancers, firewalls, all that kind of stuff. In fact, it never leaves memory. So is it because they share? <sighs> effectively, yeah. So the 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 the, the connectivity you, you get. So you can have a machine instruction on the mainframe because of the the the, the cabinet to cabinet connectivity, even across the 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 computer room floor you can have a machine instruction on box A that can access memory in box B. Uh, and you don't have to go out the door, round the network, come back in again. What happens when it gets compromised? Then you've got the keys to the castle. If it gets compromised. But that's the same as if any database gets compromised. Difficult to interrupt it, you would have firewalls in the middle. You could have firewalls in the middle if you want, but you've got the, you've got the, the you've, you've got, got to have got, got yeah, you've got, but, <laughs> It looks like a network, but it all happens in memory. It'll still be faster at the point. I mean, yeah. You're not going to have to try to back. Yeah, and it's effectively from, from your, your, your ser it is literally an egress from the service. So it's not so much something's compromised coming in. It's assuming you have done, you, you, you have made sure that you're not vulnerable to like SQL injection attacks and all that kind of stuff. Your call should be fine. Should be fine. <clears throat> Sustainability, it's one plug, basically. Uh, so there's about an 80% power saving uh, to comparing the, the equivalent stack of x86s, you need to get the same amount of grunt, which is incredible. So for Lloyds, Lloyds have got a pledge that anything they invest in will be carbon neutral by 2050, but they've also said that anything they do will be carbon neutral by 2030. Um, so this is a, a biggie. Uh, uh, for Lloyds as far as reducing our carbon footprint in the data centre. Scalability. So on one of these new Z16s, you have got 200 processing units up for grabs. Um, you won't switch them all on at once. Um, you have got horizontal and vertical scalability in the same box because you can configure things to either stamp out more ZVMs, more clusters, uh, or you can add more grunt um, to the, the, the clusters that you've stood up. Uh, and the pricing for this is now starting to look more like cloud. So before people used to say mainframe was expensive because they were obsessed with MIPS and, and how things get chunked up. Uh, but this, the, the pricing for, for running load workloads on the mainframe is starting to look more cloud friendly. Uh, disaster recovery is another biggie because obviously we chatted about the whole kind of six nines if you've got metro uh, uh, area uh, failover. You get that for free. So when you come to build uh, your uh, OpenShift cluster somewhere else or you need to plan for disaster recovery, you still need to plan for disaster recovery when you're running it on Z, but you inherit a lot of the disaster recovery from the native infrastructure. So the fact that you have got um, fault tolerant memory, so I'm thinking of when we were talking about the spec for the, the, the Z16, um, it was 40 terabytes of RAM. So RAM is a, a array independent blah, blah, blah memory as opposed to RAM. It means the memory is striped. 
so the machine is fault tolerant to, to failures. Uh, operating model. So again, you don't need any additional staff because within the organization, we've already got guys who look after Linux for Z. Uh, this is another flavor. So the, the whole setup and watering of the infrastructure uh, is all done by the team who are already there. So it's all wonderfully straightforward. Uh, and certainly within Lloyd's, uh, we are sharing the billing model uh, with the, the guys who price out the uh, public cloud and the uh, internal private cloud. So we're just going to be uh, a spectrum. So very quickly, what are our first couple of use cases? So first use case is infrastructure simplification. Uh, IBM and Red Hat have produced a range of cloud packs. Uh, and those cloud packs are literally just add water bits of infrastructure. Um, we have uh, a message broker uh, running on Linux on Z today, but it's monolithic. So loads and loads of teams, lots of, lots of messages. If any of those teams wants to make a disruptive change, then everybody who shares that broker takes an outage. So with Cloud Pack for integration, we can give every team who wants a message broker their own broker running in a container. And so if we have to do a disruptive change, only one team's affected. That by itself kind of sells this. And again, we've got the kind of traditional container infrastructure for the, the homegrown apps, because on the back of the, the uh, uh, legislation, if you have got an important business service and you want to modernize it and run it in a container, do you want to kind of risk the several billion pounds you might get fined, or do you want to run on a container on the mainframe? Um, this is a pilot, but we've got teams coming to us already from within Lloyd's wanting to find out when's it going to be available. So the, our digital banking guys have uh, a thing they call the foundation server, which is when you log on to Lloyd's mobile banking, it's a thing that goes off and grabs all the data from all the different source systems and then presents you with your page. So that's high transaction. It's a huge C++ application. Uh, they want to break it into microservices. They want to do it in Go. It has to be somewhere on-prem. They've got, they've got somewhere to run it now. SCA. Um, so everybody will be getting bugged with one-time passcodes and prompted by all kinds of things now because your payment's over 150 euros. That's seen to grow. So rather than putting more kit into a data center, We'll run it on a bigger box. And so the, our SEA guys are looking at migrating the containers they've got that already run uh, the SEA application uh, onto uh, OpenShift on Zen. This isn't a, uh, a product that we see in competition with the bank's other cloud offerings. So we see this being uh, uh, part of a, a wide spectrum. So you can have Google, Azure, AWS, private x86 and mainframe. The idea is that we'd want to kind of automate uh, the choice of platform. So you've got the qualities of service you want from the application. It's a simple decision, qualities of service application, qualities of service the platform, push a button, that's it. So that we want to make the whole experience from a developer point of view <coughs> completely agnostic. So your platform agnostic, it's just another platform. And as I've gone almost on time, thank you very much for listening. Anybody else got any questions?